Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Kate Hoey. Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Brendan. So, Kate, there are always too many issues that I want to discuss with you, uh, but I want to kick off by talking about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is a place very close to your heart. That's where you're from. You'll now appear in the House of Lords uh, uh, representing an area of Northern Ireland, having been a Labour MP for Vauxhall for, for 30 years before that. And it's fair to say that the status of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom has been somewhat thrown into question by Brexit, or, or more accurately, by some institutions' response to Brexit. The European Union, the Irish government, sections of the British political class, all of them have argued in one way or another that it's just too complicated to have Northern Ireland as part of Brexit Britain when the Republic of Ireland is still in the European Union. Uh, so I want to talk about that issue with you and dig down into what's really going on here. But I want to kick off by asking about a brilliant piece you wrote for Spiked this week, uh, where you argued that the government, that Rishi Sunak's government, is on the cusp of capitulating to the EU over Northern Ireland. So could you just explain for listeners what is happening and why you think it's a problem? Well, I hope I'm wrong, but there are signs that Rishi Sunak, despite uh, supposedly being a, a Brexit supporter, uh, is not pushing very hard to really get the European Union to realise that whatever our government did uh, and how wrong they were in signing up to the uh, withdrawal agreement that actually included the protocol, which is this ridiculous word for a, a section of the uh, legislation that allows Northern Ireland to be treated differently. Effectively, it leaves Northern Ireland in the European Union. Now, I remember very clearly the referendum day. I remember my family and knowing people in Northern Ireland who got exactly the same ballot paper as I did in London, asking, did you want the United Kingdom to leave or to remain? And of course, there was a majority in Northern Ireland to remain, just as there was a majority in Scotland to remain. But it was a United Kingdom vote. Uh, and the, what the protocol then did was effectively leave us in the European Union uh, for various, in, in, in the customs territory, for various trading aspects, and also leave us under the European Court and the European um, uh, Commission rules. Uh, the reason being that um, our government and the EU Commission decided that it was much too difficult to think of having any kind of trading customs arrangements between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which was obviously staying in the European Union. And therefore, it would be better if we're going to have to protect the European single market, which I understand, yes, perhaps needs to be protecting. Although I would argue that if they want to protect it, they should be doing most of the protecting themselves in their own territory. Um, but the our government agreed to having, instead of putting any kind of technical arrangements, border of some sort, not infrastructure, but uh, some kind of barrier between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland at what would be the frontier or in the in the European Union territory itself away from the frontier, they decided that they would have a border down the Irish Sea and that therefore any goods going from Great Britain, part of the United Kingdom, into Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom, would be subject to checks and customs duties and uh, tariffs of all sorts in order to ensure that the tiny amount that might go on from Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland and then on into the e European Union uh, was not, you know, was meeting the European Union standards. And I'm afraid that what happened then initially was that that began to be um, really very, very heavily uh, implemented by the European Union. And it wasn't very long before people in Northern Ireland realised, having not quite caught on at the beginning, that this was really going to change, you know, people's, ordinary people, just everyday goods, what they could buy, what was available, businesses couldn't get access to goods coming from Great Britain. Uh, and um, it began to really make a difference to life in Northern Ireland. So that's a kind of summary of, of what happened uh, initially. But of course, since that, because the protocol 
covers something like 300 areas of technical arrangements. The European Union, when they change anything, it has to change in Northern Ireland and it doesn't change in Great Britain. So therefore, the divergence is becoming you know, greater and Northern Ireland is drip, drip, drip being left behind. Now, I know, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people who very, very keen to have a united Ireland and they obviously like this. Although I have to say there are a lot of people who are Brexiteers and who may w well wish to have a united Ireland who have opposed the protocol very principally because it actually is, um, you know, Brexit and leaving the European Union is an entirely different discussion and argument uh, than whether there should be a united Ireland. That's a very useful outline and it really brings to the fore what I think are the most important themes in this part of the discussion about the United Kingdom and its relationship with Europe and its relationship with it, with Brussels. And the, the point that you made there, as I was listening to that, I thought there are really two aspects to this, aren't there? Firstly, there are the practical challenges that the Northern Ireland Protocol or, or the separation of Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK, the practical challenges that would pose for people in Northern Ireland. And you mentioned there in relation to goods, uh, services, trade, and so on. But then there's also the broader political, almost philosophical question, which is the issue of sovereignty. And from, from my perspective, uh, it really does come down to the question of whether a sovereign nation is in control of its territory and its destiny or not. And it seems pretty clear to me that if we were to have anything like a border down the Irish Sea or any foreign mechanisms through which trading between one part of our sovereign nation and another part of our sovereign nation came to be hampered or came to be complicated, that would represent Sim very simply, a grave assault on British sovereignty, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And there's always been the two strands to the protocol. The one that's got most publicity, obviously, has been the technical trading arrangements. And that's why, you know, there's all the discussions going on about how it could be made simpler. Although, in fact, long, long before um, there was all this discussion recently, there were lots of suggestions put forward how you could have an invisible border and how you could do all that. But the crucial thing, and, and this is where, I, you know, I really sometimes wonder whether the government our own government has actually grasped this or whether they just don't want to, uh, you know, face up to it. It the Why Northern Ireland is being left under EU rules for so much and under the EU court, then the United Kingdom has actually willingly, uh, you know, given up part of its uh, territory to another institution's control. And for me, you know, leaving the European Union was not, the principle was about genuinely getting back our control of our own country so that we could do things that maybe we weren't able to do under the European Union or that we might do things differently and that our own government would be held to account. Whereas in the past, civil servants and very many people were able to always, you know, so you could always blame the EU. And yes, I blame the EU for a lot. But the reality is that, um, you know, our own government and our own civil service have to take responsibility. So for me, you know, Brexit was all about genuinely taking back control of our own country. And we haven't done that. Uh, and we certainly haven't done it. I mean, there's lots of other things about the way the government has handled leaving the European Union. I'm very, very, very disappointed in. But this is the most important because it affects the whole of the United Kingdom. And the problem with ever discussing Northern Ireland with people in Great Britain is there is a sort of attitude, oh, well, you know, it's Northern Ireland, so we don't really need to worry about it. And, you know, the union is really, it's all about Scotland and whether Scotland might ever leave. But actually, the dangers of our losing our sovereignty over part of our own country is very, very serious. And then just last week, the government decided, um, because there is no uh, government in Northern Ireland, there's no devolved government as part of the protest against the protocol. The, gov uh, the government decided that they would put through a, a statutory instrument, which is a very quick way of doing something, that they would be um, actually building customs posts at, you know, they would do it. If, if, if the Northern Ireland Assembly weren't going to build them, then they would do it. And, you know, that is completely against um, art, the protocol itself, actually, because Article 4 
of the protocol um, says that Northern Ireland is part of the customs territory of the United Kingdom. But in practice, it isn't. And as far as the EU is concerned, it isn't. So the, the government's really almost coming like with two different aspects to this and two sides to it. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, the constitutional issue is the important. And we took we took a, a group of us took um, a court case to the Supreme Court on the Act of Union, because the Act of Union, we believe that the protocol has 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 broken the Act of Union. Um, now, it went through the courts in Northern Ireland and we lost um, both at the uh, the first court and then at the appeal court. But the Supreme Court judge in Northern Ireland did say that it must go to the Supreme Court because this was a very important constitutional issue. Uh, and they accepted, the court actually accepted that the protocol had, they used this word, subjugated the Act of Union. And the, the reason this was okay was because Parliament had impliedly agreed to this. Well, as you probably remember, I don't remember anyone getting up in Parliament and saying, well, now if you vote for the um, withdrawal agreement, you're actually getting rid of the Act of Union or breaking the Act of Union. So um, I suppose what I've been trying to do and, and those of us who've been pushing this very hard is just to get a bit more understanding in Great Britain and certainly among MPs, amongst a lot of, I can't believe MPs, if they really understood this, many of them would, would be agreeing with it. But I'm afraid there's just so many other things going on in the government sphere at the moment that they just want to get, you know, they want this to be, settled and I'm very fearful that they will compromise in some way with the European Union and then try to say to people in Northern Ireland, oh look, you don't have so many checks now, you only have to show one piece of paper or you only have to um, you know, pay a little bit now and it's all going to be much, much better and quicker and don't worry, we'll, we'll sort it out without actually dealing with the constitutional position and I'm afraid that if they don't deal with the constitutional position, we won't get a devolution back in Northern Ireland in the near future. Yeah, that, that's a really important point that, you know, the potential for a compromise with the EU, which could be held up as a victory to the people of Northern Ireland because the the confusing stuff that's been happening in over the past few years would be made a little bit easier. But as you say, the principle of the matter, the principle of sovereignty would still be uh, uh, watered down. It would still be problematized by the compromises that the government would potentially make with the EU. And I wanted to ask you, you mentioned there that one of the problems that you have, you've made the case very convincingly over the past few years that we either have an in integrated sovereign nation or we don't, and therefore Northern Ireland must remain part of the UK in, in every way. Um, and you say now that part of the problem with convincing people of that is that sometimes they will say, oh, well, it's only Northern Ireland. It's not a big deal. And I wanted to ask you about that. So what this current government d is doing, despite the fact that Rishi Sunak says he's a Brexiteer, as you've mentioned, they might potentially build uh, uh, border control posts in Northern Ireland on uh, on behalf of the European Union, which would essentially recognise that Northern Ireland is part of the customs territory of the EU. Uh, they've also said recently that when they use the term UK in, in uh, regulations and discussions about the protocol, they really just mean Great Britain. They don't mean Northern Ireland as well. So this government, a supposedly Brexit government, supposedly led, led by a Brexit prime minister, is making various moves to capitulate, to, to really accept the idea that Northern Ireland must remain in some way beholden to EU rules. Uh, why do you think this government is doing that? Is it because they just don't really care that very much about Northern Ireland? Or is it also because they don't really understand what Brexit was about? Or could it be a combination of those two things? Well, I think the, the, the current prime minister really never, uh, uh, in, in my memory, got that involved in the Brexit campaign. I don't think he attended any of the rallies around the country and heard what people were thinking and how, how you know, desperately angry people were about the whole way that the country was in cahoots with the European Union and wanted that freedom and wanted that taking back control, you know, which was used so often. Um, so I don't think he was a kind of fervent uh, Brexiteer. Um but, but also, I mean, we have to remember the cons it is the Conservative and Unionist Party, um, which gets conveniently forgotten. Um, and I do think that partly there is a, a, a fear 
within government, just like they were terrified of a no deal arrangement with the European Union, which I personally would have gone well along with, because I think then it really would have made us have to do these things on our own and 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 set out to really um, make changes. Which, but I think they are fearful of of um, a trade war. You know, of the European Union punishing us by doing the sorts of things that they could do in terms of our trading relationships. I always think that's slightly exaggerated because they trade with us and, and they need our trade. But there isn't really any, I suppose, resolve at the top of government or any courage really to um, ever stand up to the European Union. There was a short while, you know, when Boris first um, was prime minister and he just won that majority where you really felt, goodness, we might actually start to be our own independent country prepared to take other countries on, at least in, in words. And that now, I think, has gone completely. And this whole idea, you know, it's hardly a minister says anything about Europe without saying the EU, without saying, you know, our friends and our friends and um, neighbours. Whereas I want to say... <laughs> You know, I don't want to call them my friends because the way they've handled the whole uh, EU protocol issue and also the whole fishing thing has just been so shocking. But I think the government want to get it over with. They want to try and, you know, get to a relationship where I'm afraid many of them probably in, in cabinet, not necessarily in backbench MPs, want to use the protocol the fact that we're still in the, you know, the customs union and single, they want to use that as a way of getting back the whole country into the single market. Because, of course, um, that's really what a lot of people argued for and wanted. They wanted, even after we'd left, they still thought that they could keep us in the single market and the customs union. And if we do that, well, we're back, really back in the European Union. I've always loved history, but there are some periods I feel I should know more about. So I've been challenging myself to learn some new things. That's why I've been watching the Mongol Empire on Wandrium to find out more about those fierce horse warriors. The Mongols are fascinating. While they certainly earned their reputation for bloodshed and brutality, it would be a mistake to dismiss them as mere barbarians. During the 13th century, the Mongols unified an entire continent, stretching all the way from the Sea of Japan to parts of Eastern Europe. At its height, it was the largest empire the world had ever seen. And did you know that Mongol Emperor Genghis Khan had so many children that today, 8% of the men in Asia are descended from him? Wondrium documentaries are full of interesting facts like these. Wondrium is an educational platform that allows us to learn about whatever we want, whenever we want. There is unlimited access to thousands of hours of audio and video content, courses, documentaries, tutorials, and more. And it is all ad-free. Plus, all of the content on Wondrium is presented by experts who really know their stuff. This year, why not challenge yourself to learn something new with Wondrium? So to ring in 2023, Wondrium is offering my listeners a 23-day free trial, but it's only available if you sign up through my special URL. Go to wondrium.com slash Brendan. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Brendan. Wondrium.com slash Brendan. It's been very clear to me from, from the start and from all the discussions on Northern Ireland that it's at least about weakening Brexit. It's at least about watering down the substance and meaning of Brexit. And and as you say, some Remainers no doubt see it as an opportunity to sneak parts of the UK back under European, European uh, jurisdiction. I, I also wanted to ask you about the role of the Irish government in some of this. The thing I have found incredibly frustrating over the past few years, as someone whose family comes from the Republic of Ireland, I go to the Republic of Ireland very often. I love the country, but the way in which the government there, particularly when Leo Varadkar was the um, sole Taoiseach, he's now a kind of rotating Taoiseach, but back when he was the sole Taoiseach of the country, uh, the behaviour of the Irish government, I thought, was quite shocking because they continually sought to uh, 
complicate Anglo-Irish relations and to argue that any removal of Northern Ireland from European customs territory or single market rules would be catastrophic for the island of Ireland and would be intolerable. And it did seem to me that at times the Irish government was being used, uh, quite willingly used, by Brussels to score points against Brexit Britain and and to wound Brexit Britain. And then the intellectual elites in Dublin in particular seemed to relish this idea that Ireland was finally getting its back on the Brits and we were going to you know, (laughs) stick a middle finger up to our former colonial rulers. What did you make of the behavior of the political and and the media establishments in in Dublin, in in Ireland, in relation to this discussion over the past few years? Well, we saw with Enda Kenny, when he was the Taoiseach, he had actually allowed his civil servants to discuss technical arrangements, because obviously it was it was going to have to be some sort of arrangement if you were going to really protect the the single market. But once Varadka came in, all of that changed and the whole mood music changed. And I think it's been incredibly uh, dispiriting and, and, and sad, actually, that, that there now is a kind of almost generation of young people growing up in the Republic who've been kind of taught almost that, you know, anti-Brit stuff is acceptable and you know, they're sort of almost rewriting history again. And that is, I, Varadkar in particular and Coveney, the, uh, who was the foreign foreign secretary, um, have gone out of their way to back the European Union. I mean, we used to joke, but I'm sure there's some truth in it that either or both of them really wanted to end up as EU commissioners. And this was their way of, you know, proving to the European Union how loyal they were to the EU. But Ireland really did the EU's um, a lot of the dirty work for them. I mean, Varadka went to those meetings and had pictures of customs posts that were blown up years before showing them. Now, you know, he didn't actually say, and this will definitely happen, but he showed that showed them in the context of saying, this is what happens when there are border posts. Well, of course, those were those were border posts that were about security, nothing to do with trading, you know, and also he continually um, misinterpreted the Belfast Good Friday Agreement as if it was talking about no no borders. Well, of course, as, as you know, the Republic of Ireland is an independent country. It's got separate currency. It's got separate uses kilometers instead of miles. It's got tax regime. It's completely different. It's an independent country. And, you know, ironically, there are all sorts of checks sometimes go on over different things to do with this um, migration and and immigration. Quite often people will be on a bus and the Garda Shikon will get on and and ask for passports. So, and, you know, identification. So all of that was pushed by the Irish government. And I'm afraid the problem is that our government, for whatever reason, will never, ever take on or even speak back against things that the Irish government have said. And we saw that with s- several secretaries of state who would never, ever want to upset the Irish government. And I think it's very, very disappointing. Uh, and in the end, my personal view is that, you know, the European Union, when Ireland has has sort of satisfied whatever they needed to do for them, uh, could easily be, you know, chucked away or, you know, not given the support and help that they have been because they have been given. I mean, there have been a lot of things happened in the Republic of Ireland that other EU countries haven't been able to quite get away with some of the. And now, of course, there's the changes to the tax regime, the corporation tax uh, regime, which has been so important to the Republic's um, economy, um, although it hasn't really created any what I would call real jobs, you know, it's it's very much the American companies coming over and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's given a lot of money to the Republic of Ireland and they've done very well. But ultimately, um, you know, they're a very small country on the fringes of the European Union now with us not there beside them. And uh, it, this could, chickens could come home to roost and there is a growing um, movement of anti-EU feeling very, very small yet, but could grow just like it did in um, the United Kingdom. Yeah, I agree. And I can't help feeling that the Irish establishment has almost a sadomasochistic relationship with the EU because I think people sometimes forget 
how badly the European Union has treated Ireland uh, at different periods over the past 15 or 20 years. You know, the Irish people voted against the Nice Treaty and they were forced to vote again. They voted against the Lisbon Treaty. They were forced to vote again on that because apparently they're so stupid and they gave the wrong answer the first time around. Of course, we had the Troika going into Ireland and essentially taking over banks and taking over financial policy because the Irish people couldn't be trusted to do any of it themselves. So Ireland has been treated at at various times almost like a colony of the European Union, and yet the Irish establishment keeps doing the bidding of Brussels uh, in relation to Brexit Britain, which I just find to be a very curious relationship to have. They did get, of course, quite a lot of money in terms of being able to do lots of road, new roads and uh, lots of money going into their transport Structure, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I I don't know how any you know self-confident Irish man or woman could have stomached really the way they were treated over those treaties and being asked to do it again. And I think, of course, that's that's what's wrong with the EU. They thought we would be asked again, as we nearly were. If Labour had got away with it, we would have been having another referendum and another one until we finally voted to stay in. Yeah, absolutely. Just a couple more quick questions on Brexit before I ask you about, uh, I want to ask you about a few other issues as well. This year is going to be seven years since we voted to leave the European Union, which is incredible that it's been that long. Uh, We're still talking about the possibility that Brexit will be sold out in some way, particularly through the Northern Ireland issue, as you've just been touching on. Why, Why do you think Brexit remains this problem for so much of the British establishment, that the government, the civil service, who are uh, many of whom are very anti-Brexit, uh, the left establishment in particular. Uh, you were uh, a Labour MP for a very long time. I, I know you're now a non-affiliated peer, so you have experience of of, of Labour and some of its hostility to Brexit. What is it about Brexit that has really hit the establishment so hard? Do you think it's a, it, they were just shocked that ordinary people dare to defy? the advice of their betters who were all telling them vote to remain, vote to stay, otherwise we'll go to hell in the handcart. Are they still bruised from that act of defiance by millions of voters? What is it that means they can't quite accept the idea that Britain should be completely out of the European Union? Well, I think there was obviously a shock. They were shocked. You know, the polls had assumed uh, that Remain was going to win. But Remember, we're very. The country is very London oriented. Very, and in London, of course, you have um, very clearly the you know the establishment are based in London. They don't really get an awful lot of civil servants. Don't get out of London. They don't listen to people. They don't understand what's going on up in some of our our, our poor areas or parts of the northeast or those areas in the red wall seats that did actually vote very strongly to leave. And I also think although they would never admit this, it's a kind of lack of confidence in, um, mm. in within the civil service, I think. They've been used so long to more or less everything had to be run past or checked or came from Brussels. That they're, you know, they're having to learn to stand on their own two feet. And the problem is ministers seem to be listening too much to th- their own civil servants who just have this inherent attitude that we shouldn't have left and we should be trying to do everything, you know, to get back in again. We're not helped by the media, of course. Uh, I mean, some of the media, um, you know, the BBC, I think, is has played a, a shocking role. I mean, it, it was admitted more or less that they were quite biased during the actual referendum. But since that even, there's just always this superior attitude taken by many journalists that somehow anyone who who voted to leave must you know, now be regretting it. That that's you know that's the line they're trying to put uh, push. That you know everyone now, lots of people want to actually go back in, which of course I don't think is true at all. It may be true of a, few, a very small number of people, but certainly in those strong areas, I think what they they are just so angry about is that they haven't got a real proper Brexit in in terms of taking back control completely and being able to take advantage of some of the things. And, you know, the the withdrawal agreement at the time, it was seen as a great sort of, well, we've got something through. But when when it's look at it in detail, there's an awful lot of things that are still allowing the European Union to have 
various influences and and not control necessarily but you know looking at just the way we we kind of give in on too many things and fishing is a ex- classic example of that um you know we all those fishermen and women who just were desperate to get out of the eu clutches and to get their eu ships out outside of their way um have been have been really kind of abandoned so it is depressing of course we've now got a labor party leader in Keir Starmer who was the key person in parliament during the whole debate after we voted to leave in terms of the legislation who was trying all the time to make it as difficult as possible and to get another referendum so i have no confidence whatsoever in um Keir Starmer's views that he's saying, you know, we're now not thinking of leaving and we're not, um, you know, we're we're all kind of Brexiteers. He didn't quite say that, but that's what he's implying. Um, and, uh, you know, there, th- th- he may well not, he may well know that there's no way he can actually get a referendum to, you know, get us back in. But, you know, we can be back in 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 practice without actually in name if we do lots of the things that he would like to do, and particularly if if um, some of his own party and particularly the mayor of London pushing for us to go back into the single market. I, I wanted to ask you about um, Labour and the left and and their relationship with Brexit because I don't Is think it's left quite... anymore in the Labour Party. <laughs> well, the people who, who I think would call themselves yeah. left. Um, yeah. Who knows what they are, really? But one of the most curious things in the Brexit years, which I just don't think was commented off on widely enough, there were some people who did comment on, on it. You, for example, people like Paul Embury, people like Morris Glassman as well, and, and others, who met, who talked about the fact that in the past it tended to be people on the left who were very Eurosceptic. They were mm. often at the forefront of arguing that uh, being tangled up in the European Union was not good for the British economy, was not good for ordinary British people, and was not good for British democracy. I mean, Tony Benn made some brilliant arguments about why being in the European Union was a problem for democracy. And that got completely lost, didn't it, over the past few years? And we had a situation where, for a period of time, to be left-wing meant being anti-Brexit, and it meant supporting the European Union against the British government and essentially against the British people who had the temerity to vote leave, you know, the low information public as they were viewed. How do you think that shift on the Labour side of politics or the left side of politics, how did that come about? Did did they just lose faith in the people of this country and that drew them ever closer towards the kind of behind the scenes bureaucracy of Brussels? What do you think was going on there? Well, it was a longer, it was quite a longish process. I mean, I remember voting against the Maastricht Treaty back in, must have been 1992 or three. And um, we had kept Labour opposition, led by John Smith, had kept um, the, the debate going with loads of amendments for literally months. And then on the final vote, we were ordered to abstain. And I, and, and I think it was about 45 of my colleagues, including people like Tony Benn and wonderful Peter Shore and all voted uh, against. And um, that was when I, <laughs> that was when I first was, was lost, lost my, my terribly important shadow, um, shadow job, which was with Mo Molum on something called Citizens Charter, which people may well remember with some great Labour idea. It was a Citizens Charter minister. Anyway, and then of course we got I mean, Neil Kinnock had changed things a bit, but Tony Blair really set out to, once he was in power to make us all love the EU. And, uh, you know, I remember very clearly as I was in the Home Office for a while with Jack Straw and then Sports Minister. And, you know, everything was about um, working closely with the EU. You know, we had to be seen to be working with them. We had to move more and more towards um, majority voting uh, and all of that. And people just fell away. I mean, so much so in terms of elections, uh, the, the members of parliament, that when it came to the whole debate on having a referendum to start with and then um, the actual uh, debates once we did leave and during the campaign, there were not really only half a dozen of us on the Labour side who were prepared to openly speak out. And 
we were treated as if we were some kind of nutters. I mean, I'm putting it like that, if you're allowed to use that word these days. Um, you know, we were treated as if, well, you know, I think at the beginning we were kind of indulged a well. It's only if you know it's only a few of them and they don't, you know, don't worry. But as time went on and it became clearer that there was a growing swell for leaving, I think they began to um, you know, worry a little bit. Um and I've, you know, one of the most satisfying things was was doing some of the campaign big rallies around in labor areas where you would get people coming up to you at the end of the meeting and saying, oh, so nice to see a Labour MP here because we feel abandoned. And there was that real sadness in many Labour areas that they just couldn't understand. Now, I mean, I haven't really answered your question. Um, it, it, it's just one of those things where I think that it was the, you know, the idea that the European Union was going to give us better and better, you know, workers' rights and all of those things, which was all nonsense because most of the stuff that we got was through trade unions and hot campaigning and indeed in many areas were better than the European Union. So I think Labour lost its way uh, in terms of the EU under Tony Blair. And really by the time it got to the seriousness about the referendum, there wasn't much that we could do. And even MPs who had hardline leave constituencies still felt that they had to support staying in that yeah that was a, a very extraordinary moment and i think the the work that people like you and also uh Gisela stewart and a few others grim, grim stringer he was oh the, yes that's right yeah and kelvin hopkins and then you know it, it was it was a nice little group of us and we you know we and actually uh, dennis skinner in the early days when you know during the first bit he would come in voting with us and it was very always very funny about dennis because dennis didn't like to vote in anything where he was with the Conservatives, the Tories. So he would, he would, we would sort of know he, and, you know, the Tories, the Brexiteers there knew he was coming in to vote. So they would always sort of, it was literally, Dennis was allowed to sort of scoot in ahead of everybody so that he didn't, he wasn't mixing with the Tories. It was quite funny. Yeah. Uh, but I think it, it was just very important for, as, as you just described them there, that the great many people in Labour seats who wanted to vote Leave, I think it was important for them to be able to see Labour politicians who were on their side and, and that they hadn't been completely abandoned by that party, although I'm sure yeah. they, they must have felt like that. But in in relation to that question, I, just, I did want to ask you just to bring it on a little bit, just about the current state of the Labour Party more broadly. Mm -hmm beyond the issue of Brexit. And and you've mentioned the Red Wall voters and, and the way in which Labour has become increasingly distant from that section of the electorate. And we saw that with the catastrophic election losses that Labour has suffered over the past couple of years. W what do you think is the, is the root problem for the Labour Party at the moment? Uh, is it simply that it has become too much of a city-focused, middle-class party for the graduate elites and it's kind of left behind its its working class base. It, is there a, a contribution of the culture wars as well, where Labour has just become too woke? And we've even had situations where Keir Starmer hasn't been able to give a straight answer to the question of whether a woman can have a penis, which will just shock, I think, lots of ordinary voters out there. What do you think has happened with Labour that there has become such a huge gap between it and and the people it was founded to represent. Well, I think it. I think it. See, you know, there is not a working class base in the Labour Party membership anymore, and certainly mm. not in the you know in London in particular. Uh, and there's the very much a feeling that they're they're not even thinking of people who you know who who are out of work or who are working very hard in low paid jobs in areas outside London. Um, and the, you know the whole question of of left right within the party. I mean, they're moving so much that you really some of the things that Keir Starmer has said now uh, recently are so much more towards what in the past would have been utterly condemned as um, being you know right wing. I mean, just just what he said on the National Health Service. I mean, whether whether you think the National Health Service needs reforming and probably does. In fact, I know it does, but. You know, the way he came across talking about that is just is moving him closer and closer to the Conservatives. Now, he he obviously they've obviously decided that in order to counteract the sort of 
Jeremy Corbyn leadership that they have to show that they are now, you know, a middle class party. Mm. Well, they always were a middle class party, even under Jeremy Corbyn. So, you know, it's I just can't see how anything that Keir Starmer is doing or saying, you know, for getting the Conservatives and the mess they're making of things, how anything that he's doing or saying is going to win back uh, Labour voters in those red wall seats. I think many of them will just not vote or depending on what happens to, say, the Reform Party or some of the other um, changes that are happening in, in the political landscape, maybe some of them will will switch to that. But I can't see the point, really, of the Labour Party at the moment. I, I, I feel it's very sad because when I came in, it was full of people who had worked down the mines, who had been in the industry, who came into being in Parliament in maybe 40s or 50s. Now it's a completely new... You know, you have to be, you have to be a a minority of some kind almost to become a Labour candidate, mm. and very very young. So I I really um suppose have have sort of given up on them, which is very sad because I was a Labour MP for thirty years and tried very hard to be as loyal as possible. It wasn't very easy. Yeah, I think a lot of people will share your view that it's it's difficult to see the point of the Labour Party at the moment and. I'm sure there's even confusion in the upper echelons of the Labour Party as to, as to what they're all about and, and what they should be doing. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. We've talked about the union, of course, quite a lot. And I really did want to get your thoughts on another clash in the union that's taking place at the moment, which is between um, Nicola Sturgeon's Scottish mm-hmm. National Party and uh the Conservative government, essentially, the Westminster government, over the gender recognition bill, which um, the Scottish Parliament pushed through in December. It would allow people to change their gender in a much easier, streamlined way. And it would also lower the age at which people could change their gender from 18 to 16. Lots of people raised concerns about this, but uh, it was pushed through by the Scottish Parliament nonetheless. And and as you know, it's now going to be blocked by Westminster because it, it poses, in their view, it poses a challenge to UK-wide laws, especially pertaining to equality and to women's equality. What do you think is 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 going on there? What, what do you think that clash speaks to? I think the government's quite right on this because, um, I, I mean, I think people need to remember that they're using a power that was actually people like Donald Dewar, who was so involved with get, setting up the whole Scottish devolution, um, very much thought was important to be included this section, I think it's 35 par, which um, it's the first time it's actually been used in, you know, since um, devolution. And that, and that, you know, that's something that obviously it's not being used in a, um, you know, a silly way. It's being used because it was put in by those who wrote devolution for a reason. And that, that was the reason, presumably, was that there had to be a balance between what devolved governments can do and what the United Kingdom government could do. And, um, you know, it, it's not going to be used very often. But I think on this case, uh, it did have effects on the rest of the United Kingdom, the decision that they took to lower the age of 16 and to allow only two years before, you know, and I, I'm having been a former sports minister, I'm very, very concerned about the um, the way that sport and women and girls sport can be absolutely turned upside down by people who may be able to come and compete 
um, supposedly on an equal footing, but who are certainly not equal, it, you know, even if they've gone through um, the long procedure to change. Uh, and I, 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 I think the government, I think the government's right. I think she will use this very much um, to, you know, try and push the independence case. But I think it's the wrong one for her to be pushing because I'm not sure in the depths of Scotland, outside of Gen, perhaps the capitals, um, th there will be people crying out for um, this legislation to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Kate, my, my last question for you is on uh, whether we need to improve the culture of political debate in this country. I'm just thinking in particular about the tendency towards demonization and cancellation that we often see today. Uh, I mean, you get heat from right on people for having supposedly wrong views. We've seen the witch hunting of J.K. Rowling, which happens every single day. Uh, one current story is Jeremy Clarkson, who's been chased from pillar to post because of a column he wrote about Meghan Markle in The Sun. Every day there seems to be another I guess you could call it a two minutes hate, like something out of 1984, where everyone rages against someone who's guilty of wrong thing and tries to shut them down. But surely it isn't the lifeblood of political debate that we are just free to say what we want to say and people, other people are free to criticise. And this instinct to shut things down is going to harm our political culture more broadly. I've, I think freedom of expression, freedom of speech is used very blandly by some people who really don't mean it, because if they meant it, they would be speaking out on all of these things. And I'm afraid there's still a lot of people just putting their heads down and not speaking out, uh, partly because they do get a lot of abuse. But the more people who speak out, uh, the easier it is. And, you know, we're very lucky in in, in the Lord's um, to have someone like Claire Fox, who has just been brilliant on this and has really, I think, um, brought the whole debate on freedom of speech to people, perhaps in the Lords, from some of the more eminent Lords who haven't really had to listen to this so directly. And I just think that we are on a very slippery slope. Obviously, people who threaten and and make, you know, a speeches or whatever that would be really actually calling on anyone to, to quit, commit violence. That's totally different. But being able to say something that someone else disagrees with, you have to be allowed to do that. And that's why I'm very, I'm very disappointed in the, you know, the public order bill, some of the issues to do with uh, abortion zones, where we saw that a uh, lady who was silently praying, you know, the idea that someone could be arrested for silently praying inside some zone that has been decided that because people were uh, against oh, a particular um, legal action, which is, you know, abortion is legal, but that then they should be um, arrested. It's just, I, I, I just think we're again on this, you know, slippery slope, which Afterwards, when when we've gone further, people will look back and say, how could we have let this happen? And we let it happen because people who should know better and do know better aren't prepared to actually publicly say things. And we've allowed the establishment in, in the civil service in particular to get away with doing all sorts of things that are just nonsense and need to be called out. And I will continue to do that as much as I can. And fortunately, as I say, we've got colleagues in, in the Lords who are prepared to speak out. Kate Howey, thank you very much.